Derek Black, welcome to the Inquiry Minds podcast. Yeah, thanks for having me on. It's a pleasure to be here. Okay, so uh, to start off, can you tell the audience a little bit about yourself, what you do, and why you wrote uh, this book, Schoolhouse Burning? Yeah, I am a professor of law at the University of South Carolina, and I, I direct a constitutional law center here, but I'm very active in education, law, and policy. I've testified as an expert in, in lots of cases, litigated cases, um, but I don't think that really tells you the full stories. I talk about a little bit in the introduction. Um, you know, I didn't have a lot going for me necessarily as a young person. Um, certainly had some loving parents, but um, d- didn't have... Uh, had a lot of sort of moving around, bouncing around. As I say, you know, public education was that thing that grounded me and often wanted more for me than I wanted for myself. And so, um, you know, I think of public education as being this uh, inheritance that one generation passes on to another. And I certainly feel like I got my fair share of that inheritance and and wanted to make sure that I uh, pass it on to, to the next generation. And it's certainly at risk right now. Right. And, and how did that experience in public education shape who, uh, who you ended up becoming, which is uh, a lawyer and uh, eventually, obviously, a law professor? Yeah, I mean, look, you know, on some level, you're just kids trying to, you know, stay out of trouble and, and keep your parents happy with, with, with your grades. But, you know, there were any number of decisions along the way that teachers made to give me opportunity, right? I mean, I think I tell a story in the book that um, when I was a junior in high school, well, actually, say when I was a sophomore in high school, the teachers described AP English and what was involved in it and said, you know, if you want to, if you want to be in that, you need to take this paperwork home to your parents. Well, when they described the work, I have to be honest, it didn't sound like something that I would be interested in. So I threw it in the trash. I never took it home. The next year when I showed up for the first day of school and I was in AP history, I was like, what, what in the world am I doing in here? I raised my hand and said, you know, Ms. Calhoun, I'm not supposed to be here. And she said, well, we'll talk about that after class. We never did. And the rest is history. Now there's one version of that story that says, you know, look, that's not right. The parents didn't make the the decision. Um, You know, something funny is going on. There's another version of that. It's the same. It's been going on for decades and centuries, which is, you know, adults looking at a child and saying that this child can do better and I want to help him do better. And that's certainly what seemed to have happened there. The other sort of more obvious part of my background and history is that I graduated from Clinton High School, which was the first high school, traditionally white high school in the South to graduate an African-American. After Brown versus Board of Education was decided, it was the first place that Thurgood Marshall went. And the, since it was such a small little town, you know, the request was easy. There were about half a dozen African-American children about 200 yards up the hill behind the white high school who'd been traveling about an hour to a different county to go to high school. And he said, let them walk off the hill. We're not talking about busing. We're not talking about, you know, anything complicated. Let them walk off the hill. And the federal district court in, in Knoxville agreed. Said, yeah, let the kids walk off the hill. And, you know, that story shaped Clinton, Tennessee. It shaped Clinton High School. We had some tumultuous times there. But it shaped me too, you know. And I didn't fully understand that story as a young person, but when I got into college and and was majoring in African-American studies and began began to sort of situate situate the pieces of my life in this larger tapestry of American history, um, I realized what a profound effect it had had on me and and my democratic and racial values. And so I'm incredibly lucky to have gone not just to public school, but to have gone to an integrated Clinton High School. Right. And, and obviously, in your book, you describe how uh, privileged and, and how lucky you were to go to a, a very good uh, public high school, uh, public and get a good public education. Um, can you, it seems to me that like public education has had had this promise historically of being this great unifier, especially in American history. Uh, you discuss that in the country's founding, uh, George Washington, 
John Adams, Thomas Jefferson, all discuss the importance of having uh, quality public education. How how was that different historically than pretty much any other country at that time and still is today? Well, there's a couple of things going on. I mean, first, I, I always say, look, our, our public education has never been perfect, never was. Hopefully it will be someday, but that ultimately the story of America, the story of a more perfect union is, is also the story of a more perfect schoolhouse. Um, so with that said, you know, I think the importance of the American story, understanding it wasn't perfect, was that America was committing to self-government by regular people. Right? At that moment in history, in the late 1700s, the world is ruled by kings and queens. America itself is coming out from under the rule of a monarch. The idea that, well, and actually, there's a lot of folks in America that said, okay, we need our American king now. The idea that you're just going to turn over political power to regular people uh, was a radical idea then. And of course, our founders were, were committed to that, but they understood or believed that if we're going to hand over education to regular folks, those folks need to be educated. So there's a radical idea early on. The other thing you see is that, again, you know, obviously, you know, African Americans were enslaved uh, in the South and in parts of the North at that point in time. Uh, we did not have a robust public education system, but because of our commitment, we still had more education than anyone else. So that by the early 1800s, there's only one other country in the world, and that's Prussia that has more public access to education in the United States. So not perfect, but starting out in the right direction, starting out in the right direction. And, and as I said, you know, each major epoch and jump forward in our history has been uh, in, in terms of jumping forward in democracy, expanding it for women, expanding it for minorities and others has also been about expanding it for that, those same groups at the K through 12 level. Right. And you obviously just said that, you know, there's never been a perfect public education system, uh, hopefully, and that's my hope as well, that we one day will have a perfect education system. Uh, but what do you think if you, by studying history, do you think there was a time in history where public education was better than it is now? And um, qual qual whether it be quality wise um, or just the, because everyone always talks, I think from past generations, they're always like, there was a better time. And, you know, there was, um, this was better back then. This was better, better back then. But I think public education is one of those things that I've seen in my lifetime where, um, people for, of older generations describe going to public schools and it was completely different than what it is that, that it, what it was for me. Right. I'm not saying I got a bad education, but, um, the content taught in my schools was way different than uh, taught back in the day. Yeah, I mean, I think in the, one of the things we always have to remind ourselves with with public schools and other forms of school is you should never paint with a broad brush because there's just an enormous amount of diversity in terms of the resources, the context, and the goals. And so to answer your question, I would say, you know what, I think there were times and places in history when our schools, uh, some schools, uh, were better than they are today. I actually, I, I do believe that. But I don't think all of our public schools were better for everyone at, at some prior point in history. I think there's, there's sort of jumps forward in certain contexts and fall backwards in other contexts. But to say, to talk about, you know, it being better, um, you know, I think a time when parents and teachers and, well, parents and teachers at least, seem to be on the same side uh, of the equation, that was a better time. And particularly if parents, teachers, and students were all on the same side. And what I mean is on the same side of what now are sort of public policy debates where, you know, we have, you know, some parents that, you know, think teacher unions are highly problematic. Um, I don't think a lot of parents think that. But we have teachers that are under enormous pressure to, to perform, to produce students with certain results on um, standardized test scores. And when they don't, they are labeled as the problem or the enemy uh, or, 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 or something to be fixed by the state legislature. And so they're pitted, right? The teachers are pitted against others. 
And by the same token, we have students um, who maybe aren't because the overall dynamics of a school um, and the system of delivery are not, uh, they don't have the same depth of relationship with their teachers on a consistent basis uh, that, that, that some of them used to have. And to me, those are, that, that all makes education worse, right? Um, you know, in, in today's world, you know, education becomes more and more consumer. So, you know, uh, teacher tells student something, student doesn't like it, student tells mom or dad, mom and dad go down there and complain to the teacher. You know, when I was growing up, and this isn't like the good old time, when I was growing <laughs> up, if I came home and said, hey, you know, Miss X, she's, you know, I, she's not doing this, or I don't like this, or I don't like that, can you go talk to her? You know, I believe my parents would have thought the problem was with me, not with her, right? And, and they would probably would have been right about that, you know? And so, you know, there's a lot of that. I think, you know, it, 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 education has become about producing standardized test scores, producing graduates. We should always have high, high achievement. We should always produce graduates, but we actually are all on the same side. And, and we've gotten to a place where, where that's not always the case. That That's harmful. You know, the other side of this is, you know, um, even if, you know, this form of all on the same side of education was great in the 50s or 60s, we have to understand that a lot of those schools were segregated too. So yeah, they're better in one way, but worse than another. Um, by the same token, even on questions of integration, our schools were, were far more integrated. In fact, they were, they were highly integrated in a lot of instances uh, in the 70s uh, and 80s. And now we've lost all of those gains. So in the South, uh, for instance, the height of, of integrated schooling in the South um, what came you know, in the late 70s that between you know 68 and sometime in the mid 70s we went from having less than one percent of our schools in the south being desegregated uh to about 40 percent. i mean that's like have you ever seen anything improve that much that rapidly and that was enormous the problem is <laughs> we've lost all of those gains so it depends on the issue it depends on who we're talking about some things were better some, some things weren't yeah, and I think uh, a general theme that runs through your book is there's this um, those are there's a purpose for public education historically, right? And uh, it seems to me I don't know where and how most congressmen and senators were uh, educated, where whether they went to public school or when they went to private schools or whatnot. Um, but it seems to me that. Uh, everyone has to be kind of in line with the main purpose of public education. And it seems that we've lost it generally, right? The conversation now is, is about uh, success, right? What, what, what does success mean in education? Right. And um, I often felt like there, there, yes, you could study for a test and you could do well on an exam, but does that necessarily mean that you are, uh, proficient in your subject, right? I think tests have their place, but is that really how we're going to define success? And that leads me to my question, which it feels like we've lost the purpose of public education. Um, what, so what is the purpose of a public education rather than some of the things we'll go into further uh, later on, like voucher programs and uh, charter schools? Yeah, I mean, I would say first and foremost, going back to the founding and I think even you know, well up through the 1800s and maybe even the early 1900s, the purpose of public education, first and foremost, is the preparation of citizenship, preparation for citizenship, preparation for voting. Right? Now, uh, those same skills are, are transferable to the workplace in many instances, but you, know, you read the constitutional clauses, they say, we are enacting the state constitutional clauses. We are enacting these because public education is the sur surest guarantee of a Republican form of government, which means democracy. And the other ones say it's the, it's the surest guarantee of the preservation of our rights and liberties. So the idea being the only way democracy works is if folks are educated. And the only way folks can protect their own individual rights and liberties is if they have the education to do it. So, you know, that's what, that's what it's about first and foremost. And, and it is, you know, it is increasingly about something other than that uh, now. 
and you know we see it being attacked on any number of levels and you know we can get into it in conversation but it's really distressing to me when i hear you know one individual choice right well no individual runs government by themselves we the people right operate a government that works for all of us and and public education is the first experiment experience we we have with government and it is the proving grounds hopefully to 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 bringing people into that self-government so it isn't just about what you want it's what we the people want and need to be able to, to get along and survive uh, a, a, as a society and culture and then you know we have this government schools as, some, as though there's something pejorative about this concept of coming together in a common space with common values I find that incredibly problematic um, and and then you know this sort of final point that we hear with this individual choice and, and labeling it, you know, pejoratively as government schools, um, you know, we hear that they're indoctrinating uh, children and, and, you know, there's all these bad values. Well, if what we're indoctrinating our children uh, toward is the belief that we ought to be civil towards one another, that we ought to follow the rule of law, right, that we ought to find common ground instead of dividing ourselves into silos, I say, then indoctrinate the heck out of them. All right. That's not indoctrination. That's just being a good, decent human being. Um, so I think there's, you know, there's a lot of false rhetoric that's being thrown at our public schools right now. And, you know, one of the, th the thesis of the book is that these arguments aren't just attacks on public education. If you understand what public education is, these are attacks on the very system of democracy that we have here in this country. Right. And obviously that's, that's problematic, but when when do you I know you describe it in the book, but when did you see that shift historically from people prioritizing public education and knowing the importance of public education to all of a sudden it seems it seems sometimes when you read the uh, a book, uh, you, whether it be yours or other books about education policy, it seems like it happened overnight. Obviously, nothing happens overnight. Mm -hmm. but um, when, when did that shift begin to occur and why did it gain so much traction? Yeah, I mean, I would say that, first of all, Jennifer Berkshire and, and, um, and Jack Schneider have a great book um, that, that came out. It came out just a few months ago, uh, Wolf at the Schoolhouse Door. And they, they cover a lot of this modern history in, in more depth than I do. Mine sort of covers a longer period of history. But the short story is that, you know, during the late 70s and early 80s, there is this sort of rise of anti-government sentiment and neoliberalism, sort of idea that government can do no good, um, you know, taxes are too high, you know, et cetera, et cetera. Now, that doesn't really get too far early on. You know, um, Nancy McLean, wrote a book um, about the Koch brothers and, and James Buchanan and some others who sort of developed this ideology. You kind of had some rich folks and a few academics in a room uh, sort of thinking up the privatization of public education and other forms. And the rest of the public's like, you know, th th those folks are cuckoo. But they kept spending their money. They kept holding their conferences. They kept on and on. They kept sort of you know, lining the pockets of, of legislators. And, you know, they eventually began to get a little bit of a foothold in, in the 80s. You know, you see with the Reagan administration, you know, he, he was, he was going to do away with the Department of Education. Um, you know, he also wants to do block grants, you know, to the states. You, you see these sort of sudden shifts. He's also sort of concerned about big taxes. But it still seems like this sort of undercurrent. Right, it's not really mainstream, but the rise of the Tea Party gives a little bit more life to some of that general ideology. Not it's not public education yet, but it's it's, it's general ideology. And you know, vouchers are are growing, right? The, you know, it's Bill Clinton, right? That that uh, you know his administration makes some new inroads for 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 charter schools. But look, all this stuff is still small time experimental type stuff or fringe, you know, political movements at that moment in time. You know, in my mind, things really take off uh, right around 2000. Initially, you have Florida where, where Jeb Bush, who's committed to a lot of these ideas, initiates 
uh, a voucher program, a big voucher program in Florida, but that gets struck down. Um, and so, you know, they're not really going anywhere. Charters are sort of muddling along. And then your big tipping point, in my mind, is the recession, the Great Recession, because now we're, we're at a confluence of events, right? We've got, a, we've got a national catastrophe, and some people think lowering taxes, right, is the, is the best way to get out of that. Now, look, you know, the Koch brothers had always wanted low taxes, whether it's a catastrophe or not a catastrophe, but there's this idea that that will help, you know, stimulate the economy, uh, Brownback in Kansas and then Walker in, in Wisconsin, uh, heavily supported by those, those far right elements come to power, start slashing taxes. And the natural result is they start defunding the public education system because at the state and local level, the lion's share of tax dollars goes to public schools. So when you start whacking taxes, you're whacking public schools. So you see that. At that same time, we have this other crisis, which is, well, related, which is how are we going to afford to educate these kids? I mean, we can only cut taxes so far uh, before there's not enough teachers, not enough rooms. And so there's this idea that, well, maybe someone else will do it for us cheaper, right? That all of a sudden charter schools look like a more alluring idea. We can cap costs, we can push kids into this other sector, and that'll contain costs. Or, you know, we can pay for vouchers and, and, and send kids into the private sector. So you have three things going on. Low taxes, which are starving uh, public schools for money. And then you have these other sort of private options where the state can remove some kids from its fiscal accounting bills, basically, and, and, and pay at a lower rate. And those things also line up with sort of privatization and mar market force ideology that's also saying, look, public education is a monopoly and we need to add some competition. So, you know, the ideology goes back to the 70s and 80s, but the sort of rocket fuel for that ideology really begins to take hold, um, you know, during the Great Recession. Yeah, and um, actually this morning I saw an economist I, I, I deeply admire. Uh, his name is Glenn Lowry at the uh, Brown University. Mm -hmm. um, and he spoke in front of the Senate, um, what is it, the Senate Banking Committee or Senate, Senate Financing Committee, well, mm -hmm. one of those. And Senator Toomey, I can't recall what state he's from, uh, was asking a question about um, economic disparities. And, and he told, and he asked him, he asked Glenn Lowry if if education might be central to fixing some of the economic disparities that we have in society. So, for example, um, maybe we should provide parents who know best about how to educate their kids. I'm, I'm giving you their argument, obviously, um, should be allowed to um, do that. Right. They, they should be allowed to pick the school that's best for their kids, whether it be a parochial school or, a, you know, charter or private or whatever. Um, and sometimes I catch myself, again, considering myself a staunch supporter of uh, public education and, and a product of public education, I find myself curious because both of these, uh, both of these men are very smart individuals, and obviously they've thought about these issues and they know what they're talking about. And it seems that... Uh, there, 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 there's no desire sometimes to engage in these topics and try to prove the other person wrong, right? There, it's not really a debate. It's usually like hep happens, everything happens in a, in a uh, kind of echo chamber where public school advocates talk in their own communities and then you have the charter and public and voucher advocates talking in their own chamber. And um, it seems to me that the original purpose for charter schools was to experiment with different ways of educating children, right? Like um, I remember, I think in Diane Ravitch's book, she outlines um, in like Newark, New Jersey, I think, where uh, there are a lot of bad, what people considered bad public schools. And they opened up charter schools with the support of like Mark Zuckerberg and all, the, all these kind of, all these kinds of uh, billionaire characters. And it was a way of trying to experiment with different methods. So uh, should we engage in a debate with these uh, people about the merits of school voucher programs and charter 
charter schools or should we just advocate our point of view and let them stay on their own? Well, I mean, look, we, we, we have to, we have to participate in the conversation. I, I would be doing the exact opposite of what I've been telling you for, you know, the last however many minutes, if I said, look, but let's just, you know, get in our echo chambers. I mean, you know, that, that's, that's the, that's the beauty of, of, of public education. I think actually that I got very comfortable with difference. That's the beauty of, you know, being a, a white man in an African American studies program. It's a sort of beauty of being in a different situation, right? And, and, and sort of forcing you to think outside your own. And so I think all these perspectives matter, right? Everyone's perspective matters. Yeah, I think, and, and look, you know, I mean, yeah, I hate it when, if you ask me a question, it forces me to be nice because I've been, you know, fighting a good deal over these issues the last few years. But, you know, is, is there is there some form of a middle ground for, public education, charters, and vouchers. I would sit here and tell you, you know, hopefully, you know, I hope you have a, well, I, <laughs> I don't know how many people I want to hear. Yes, I, you know, I'll tell you, yes, there is a middle ground. There is a middle ground. But I will tell you that the persons who are most resistant to that middle ground are not public education advocates. It's the charter industry. It is the voucher industry. So let me, again, and, and because they will not cede a middle ground, I'm against them. So maybe that's the same. It's not that I'm, I'm against middle ground. I'm against someone who refuses to engage in middle ground. So let's talk about vouchers, for instance. You know, if what we said was we were really only going to give vouchers um, to, number one, children who were in need, uh, number two, uh, to go to schools that were of high quality, and number three, um, require that anti-discrimination provisions followed those vouchers. And then number four, to make sure it didn't increase segregation, right? So that we're not just going to have white kids leaving high poverty schools and African-American kids, you know, all of this stuff, right? The sort of public values that public education represents. If I could attach those public values to vouchers, then, I'm, then I would allow that maybe there are instances and places in the limited number of vouchers that, that could be okay. That's not what the voucher lobby wants, right? The, number one, during the recession, they did they started doing away with income cap levels. So this isn't about they they started out saying it was for for low income kids, but now you know in Indiana, I think a family of four making one hundred and eighty thousand dollars a year is eligible. Okay, so that's number one. It isn't just about poor kids. Number two, it doesn't matter what school you're at. It doesn't matter if you're at a great public school or one that's struggling. Right, you're still eligible. Yeah, and None of the prohibitions on discrimination based on um, religion, LGBTQ status, disability, uh, English language learners, all of that stuff and more, none of that goes into the private school. So we are literally either one, releasing privileged kids to go to schools where they fit in, uh, or we are releasing poor kids to try to get into schools that don't want them and they're not going to be treated fairly. And every time that you try to demand some sort of accountability, they're completely against it, right? So what am I to say other than if the option is, we're, you know, the option is an unregulated voucher system or no vouchers, then the answer has to be no vouchers. And, you know, I'm always against taking that money out of public schools, taking it from these kids and giving it to those. Same problem with charters, you know, same problem. You know, could we, Impose and you raised Newark earlier. You know the data shows that the charters, the Newark charter schools, have higher level levels of racial, ethnic, and disability segregation than the public schools. That, in, or to state it more bluntly, they enroll fewer students with disability because they don't want those students. They cost more to educate. Even within African American community itself, the students who tend to go to the charter schools in Newark have a higher socioeconomic status. So we're leaving the poorer kids in the public schools. That's not to say that the that there's wealthy kids in 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 the in these charter schools in Newark, but that they're comparatively more wealthy. And the ELL students are either staying in the public schools or being brought into charters that are pretty much only for ELL students. That's not a good thing. You know, so should we have some demographic regulation on them? Would I be more comfortable with a charter school if that's the case? Yes, I would. We also have corruption 
nothing sh short of what I would call corruption in them. There are things that today are entirely legal to do in charter schools that if you did them in a public school system, you'd be in prison. So let me give you an example of that. Most charter schools in the nation, the person who owns the charter has to be a nonprofit charter. The, that's just sort of the person whose name goes on, on the front door. So Derek Black Charter Schools, nonprofit. Okay, South Carolina has given me that. And I, that nonprofit, Derek Black nonprofit can't make money, but you know what it can do? It can let Derek and all of his brothers and sisters, although I don't, you don't have any, but all of his family members be the board members of that nonprofit. And they can then enter into contract with Derek Black uh, housing company and pay all of its rent to Derek Black. You can enter into Derek Black Books Company, pay all the costs of books, can go on down the line so that we have this facade of somehow or this is a nonprofit doing good and it can funnel all this money into Derek Black's back, back pocket. Do all charter schools do that? Absolutely not. Are there charter schools, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of charter schools across this nation that are making money off of our children every day of the week? Yes, they are. And it's completely legal. So again, you know, if we want to have a conversation about charter schools, let's have a conversation where they reflect public values. But the other side doesn't want that. And now they want to go even one step further. The Manhattan Institute is now taking the position that not only should, well, to state it simply, they're now taking the position that religious organizations, i.e., we'll just say, you know, the Catholic Church, should be able to operate charter schools and teach religion as truth in them. Now, I don't think you need a law degree to understand that a religious public charter school is an oxymoron and probably violates or ought to violate the First Amendment, but that's the position they're taking. So unfortunately, you know, it's always easy to throw stones the other side, but I, I feel like they have pushed the public education um, advocates into a corner where there, where there is no middle ground. Mm. Yeah, but I, also at the same, so more to your point, uh, you said the other side. So besides, you know, the the clear voucher advocates, the billionaires, the, the Koch brothers, or um, I think the Walton family is one of them too. But uh, besides the billionaires and the the clear voucher advocates, maybe parts of the Manhattan Institute or whatnot. Politically, um, it seems to me. Again, I'm I'm not uh, by any stretch a. Uh, public education expert, uh, but it seems to me that it used to be that one side was in support of public education at, at a point, at a point, and then the other side was against it. So um, namely, I would say maybe Democrats were for public education and Republicans were against public education. I think that came later on, but that was a trend when I was growing up. And then all of a sudden, it seemed that they merged on they don't seem to merge on much else, but they have that in common where they have they both advocate for charter schools. I've heard a lot of Democrats advocate for charter schools. I'm not sure about voucher programs, but I'm sure you could find a bunch. Um, so when we talk about the other side, who can we directly address when trying to challenge? Well, so, I mean, I, I think, you know, your, your question probably suggesting how to, you know, clear, clear or lay out the ground for a lot of folks. So, I mean, I would say public education as an issue has been bipartisan for the better part of 150, 200 years. So the idea that there was uh, some big gap between Republicans and Democrats on education is really something that's happened in the last 10 or 15 years. Um, and, and I point that, and, I, and that doesn't mean they've agreed on every little nuance of policy, but they've always been pro public education. And as I pointed out this last election, Donald Trump is the first person in the history that I've seen, first person in the history of the United States to represent a major political party for president of the United States who was not pro public education, right? Look at his platform, it's almost every, child in the nation to have private school choice. Public schools are a dead end. The reason why there's never been a person take that position before is because it's not been a Democratic or public, a Democrat or Republican issue. And in fact, most of the time, 
If you go back and look at presidential campaigns, you don't even hear education talked about during the fall campaign. Sometimes a primary issue, you never hear it talked about in the fall because pretty much everybody's kind of in the same place. So what we have seen in the last decade, and we started seeing this in the governor's races, but what we started seeing is that, yes, there were Republican governors who were now willing to come out as kind of anti-Republican, anti-public education in some respect, um, and, and Democrats you know, could not take that position. So we really are in a new place there. Uh, and that's, you know, in those levels. The other part of it is charter schools is a little bit tricky. You know, with charter schools, there was a subset of the Democratic Party that was for them and a subset of the Republican Party that was for them. And together that made a, bi a bipartisan position for charter schools. That was a bipartisan position from charter school for charter schools before we saw what I would label sort of the horrors and problems. Now what you saw in this last um, Democratic primary was across the board. Maybe there was one major Democrat, maybe uh, Andrew Chang was a little bit pro charter school, but other than him, but they were all had very skeptical of the expansive growth of charter schools. So you, you saw the Democratic Party sort of move away from them. That created a little bit of problem because there is this, you know, that we do have a lot of African-American children enrolled in charter schools. So that actually was kind of a dicey issue. There was a, a, a meeting for Senator, uh, a public meeting for Senator Warren um, down in Atlanta that got pretty touchy. She was challenged about this issue because there's a lot of a lot of African Americans support charter schools. So, um, in, in any event, so I think it, it, when we talk about vouchers, and the Democratic Party never su supported vouchers. Uh, the Republican Party had, hadn't, as a, as a group, really supported them as to recently. So, what does this all add up? I, I guess I would simplify it and say this: you look at public polling uh, data, what you'll find is that regular voters, their opinions on uh, public schools, charters, and vouchers, there's very little difference, very little difference amongst voters. In fact, on, in terms of improving, fully funding, fixing, et cetera, et cetera, all these issues in public education, what we find is that somewhere in the high 70s, low 80s um, of voters of both parties want Right, the support for the public education. So what we really have, I've talked about this in the book, what we really have is a disconnect between what regular people, regardless of political party, want and what legislators are actually doing. And so how does that happen? You know, Derek, how in the world could that be? You're sitting here telling me that 75, 85% of Democrats and Republicans want strong and robust public education, then, then why is this happening? It goes back to the question we were talking about earlier. It goes back to a man like James Buchanan and the Koch brothers spending money over a long period of time, a lot of advocacy over a long period of time that, that a narrow subset of the American wealthy public could capture the Republican Party and on the issue of education, take it away from regular everyday people. Right. And obviously these um, movements have been, as you mentioned, uh, President Trump, uh, former President Trump uh, had his probably the most I think you outlined that in the book the most unpopular Secretary of Education uh, nominee right that the nomination was the most unpopular or most contested I'm sorry in in history of that position well there's so there's two things going on like normally you know, Secretary of Education is a snoozer. Like no one cares. Whoever the president wants, fine, right? Yeah. Um, so normally you don't you don't get a big kerfuffle over it. But with her, it was 50-50. And you know, the phone call you mentioned Senator Toomey early. You know, the phone calls were coming in like crazy to these Republicans. Senator, do not vote for her. I'm talking about Republican voters. It goes mm -hmm. back to my point about where they are on public. Do not vote for her, or explain to me why you're voting for her. You know, here in South Carolina, there was a, a woman, she said, I'm a Trump voter, but I want to know, you know, why in the heck Tim Scott is saying nice things about De Betsy DeVos. I want to have a meeting with him before this vote goes down. He didn't respond to her calls. In 24 hours, she had 5,000 signatures saying, yeah, we want a meeting too. We want a meeting too. And these aren't, you know, these aren't Clinton people. These are Trump people, right? And so, heavily unpopular amongst regular regular folks of both political parties. So that's the first time it was a big deal. 
the other sort of piece of that, which just kind of shows how problematic things have gotten in, in public education, she is also the most uh, the most unpopular of any of Trump's political appointees. That she has the largest secure had the largest security detail, you know, outside of the president. I think maybe even larger than the Secretary of Defense because she was so polemic, so far out of the mainstream that people just they just they just lose their lose their stuff, you know, uh, because she was just so outrageous on so many levels. So. Um, yeah, I mean, it, it's a brave new world when it comes to education policy. I mean, the one thing, and I, you know, I don't, I don't want to say I'm not saying something negative about uh, Miguel Cardona because I think he's hopefully he's going to do a great job. But on some level, like, like he, he, he's kind of a snoozer. It's kind of boring, and that's a good thing. It's like there's nothing particularly controversial or interesting about. Well, there are interesting things. You know, he he he's an accomplished man. But point being, like. I don't think there's anyone like really excited for him or against him. And that's a good thing. That's a good thing. Right. And um, I remember when the, the announcement was made for Betsy DeVos to become nominee for the, the secretary of education position and people, they, they lost it. I mean, they, they couldn't believe that somebody like that could be a secretary of education, but also, um, you would expect a person like that, at least if they're that controversial, to be able to defend their point of view fairly well because they're used to having their back back against a wall, sort of. But even during her nomination process, she was asked questions and she just was incapable of ask of answering any of them. But um, obviously, in your book, you're you're critical of Betsy DeVos, uh, but you're also critical of uh, Barack Obama's Secretary of State Arne Duncan. And this is another one where one was very controversial, uh, namely Betsy DeVos, and people know Betsy DeVos, but Arne Duncan is one of those snoozers, right? Like he, he seemed to have a history of being like the education guy and whatever. But again, if you ask most people on the street, uh, who do you hate? Do you hate Betsy DeVos? They'd be like, yeah, I don't like Betsy DeVos, but I... And then you'd be like, do you hate Arnie Duncan? They're like, who's Arnie Duncan? But again, Arnie Duncan arguably, arguably could have done more damage. And I think than than Betsy DeVos. Um, but again, the question that I had when reading your book is this policy, uh, does policy intention matter? Like do this, because it seems like maybe Arnie Duncan had different set of intentions than Betsy DeVos, and that, that seems obvious, but the results could be equally bad. So yeah. does, pol- does intention matter? I mean, it certainly matters in terms of how the, the public perceives the person, mm-hmm. right? You know, so, some, you know the, the, some people can shake your hand and stab you in the back at the same time, and, you know, you walk away liking them, not realizing that they stabbed you in the back. You know, Bet- Betsy DeVos was not that, right? She <laughs> she scowled at you and, and, and gave you a shiv to the belly at the same time. So um, you, you knew what you were in for. You know, at, at the same time, it, it, you know, I, I say that Arnie Duncan laid the groundwork for Betsy DeVos in many respects, but there still are huge differences between, you know, Duncan and DeVos. I mean, Duncan was not for private school vouchers. I think he uh, understood and appreciate much of what I said about this complete sort of throwing the kids to the wolves of discrimination and deregulation in, in the private system. You know, he very much wanted a charter school, uh, expansion of charter schools. And I think, you know, he is willing to see the best in charter schools, uh, that they can be corralled. They still are arms of the state, that they are different. And, and again, I would allow, there is a way in which we could, we could use charter schools in, a, in, in, in maybe a, an effective way. There's things that charter schools can do that public schools can't. Uh, we, we won't get into that now. And these are, those are good things that they can do. Um, so, you know, I, I don't, I don't want to, I'm not vilifying him other than to say that, you know, he made some bad choices and you go, well, well, then what's going on there, Derek? You know, one of the stories that I tell about the Obama White House and, and, and 
Duncan is that I believe, and I just say believe because I don't know for sure that they basically got captured by the economists. You know, you were talking about economists earlier. You know, economists believe, often believe, not all economists, that if you can quantify it, you can regression analysis it, if that's a term, then you can find a solution. And they do it, you know, with iPhones and sales and marketing every day of the week. Why are public schools any different? And as big data, we're we getting bigger and bigger data and more sophisticated regression analysis. Why shouldn't, why shouldn't we be able to do it with public schools? So I think what they end up doing is convincing the White House that if we can line up the tests, we can line up the standards and we can run the right algorithms, we can fix everything. Now, I won't go through all the reasons why that's silly because on face value, you're like, yeah, of course that makes sense. But maybe it goes back to what you said to me at the very beginning about, is this really going to measure success? That being a test. Like I'm not anti-test across the board, but anyone that, that thinks that, you know, your results or my results on a standardized exam capture the totality of your experience over the course of public education is a fool, number one. And anyone who thinks that your score in English language arts in the seventh grade was not affected by the quality of your English language arts teacher in fifth, fourth, third, second grade, and first grade, and the quality of your social studies teacher, and the quality of your history teacher, well, then that person's a fool too. So even if, even if test scores could capture who you are, Stanley Goldberg, as a person, that wouldn't mean that we could attribute who you are to any particular person at your school. But the economist convinced, you know, Duncan in the White House, or maybe there weren't smart enough people to ask questions that, you know what, this is the brave new world and we can do this. And they're just flat out wrong about that. And it really decimated the teaching ranks, it made a lot of changes to teachers that it made, it's made it a lot harder to recruit them. Um, and, you know, the charter school is just sort of another version of, of the economists believing that the market is always right. And, and that's, that's not, you know, the idea of public education, you might say, is actually anti-market. <laughs> it's premised on an anti-market idea that, no, we need to do this because it's good and it produces something that can't be measured and sold, not because, yeah. you know, something else. So, you know, I, it, so it does matter where you're coming from. Um, but at the same time, you know, a mistake is a mistake, regardless of whether it was an intended one or an unintended one. Right. And uh, to your point, I, I studied uh, economics in, in college, and there was a term that always comes to mind, and that's a market inefficiency, right? So I think, um, public education is supposed to fix some of the uh, potential market inefficiencies of having a privatized model, right? Because if you have a privatized model, you have kids technically not educated at the same standard and not taught the same thing. So there's no, it almost seems like uh, one kid could be taught in school A and another one in school B in the same state, and they could be taught completely different things. The obvious example would be uh, teaching creationism or not teaching creationism, right, or uh, whatever. Uh, but I think that's um, one of those the, the market inefficiency that you described before. Um, and we just we just discussed the fact that tests don't judge absolute success in anything, right? And I don't think most people would would say it does. I, you know, you're a lawyer yourself. Uh, I'm an aspiring lawyer, so I'm trying to, I'm going to have to go through the process of taking the, you know, the LSAT and whatever. And that's a big part of admissions. And maybe I'm shooting myself in the foot here by complaining a little bit about it, but it's a learned skill, right? Like you practice enough at the test and you can probably, you know, get a better score. Um, but that's still a big part of how you get admitted into law school and how you judge potential candidates, correct? So mm -hmm. if, if we don't have a general standard of quality education, what, what does define success? How do we measure success? Because to me, um, you, can't, you can't judge it just by GPA, for example, if you're applying to law school. 
give an example. Or if you're applying to college, just based on your uh, grade point average in, in high school, because again, some high schools have higher standards than others, right? Some are harder to get into. Some have better teachers. Some, it just overall, it's more difficult. Um, and that's always been a f- frustration of mine, for example, because in, in many ways, I'm not going to toot my own horn, but like, for example, I double majored in college. I took very difficult classes, economics classes and, um, and history classes. My GPA might have been lower, say, than a person that majored in something I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to consider um, easier, right? Because the classes were easier, they were less rigorous or whatnot. But if you look at overall law school statistics, for example, you have um, average GPA is like 3.8, 3.9, 4.0. And you're like, well, I don't have that, but I took more difficult classes and that's harder to prove. Um, and I guess that's why the LSAT exists. But um, my thing, the question is, how do you measure success if not for testing and, and all these kind of methods? Yeah, I mean, look, it, the first thing I would say is that the tests have enormous value. I mean, we're sort of lumping on them. Should we be given? Yeah, we should give tests. Right? It's a snapshot, but we should understand that that's what it is. It's a snapshot. It cannot be the thing that rules the world. Um, you know, GPAs are not a snapshot, right? There's something uh, far more complete. At the same time, there's factors, as you said. Well, you know, everyone's taking different classes. So not one GPA is not readily, you know, uh, comparable to another. And, you know, rest assured that the admission officers do distinguish between schools and majors when they're looking at GPAs coming out of college. So, you know that they'll 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 take care of you there. So, but then there you know there's graduation rates too. There's sort of minimum levels of competency. So I mean, in my mind, first of all, you know, you'd be better off to ask somebody with a PhD in education than me of this question. But 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 my in my mind, it's easier to say, do we have all the necessary components for success for a child? in our public schools. And if so, then we will expect that that child is gonna live up to his or her potential. But if we do not have all the necessary components for that child to be successful, then his or her only chance of success is really to overachieve, right? So to me, the question is, you know, do we have classrooms that are small enough? Do we have teachers with the experience and credentials to teach in the subject matters that they're teaching? And the, and the and the p- people skills to teach those courses, right? Do we have the mental health counselors, right, to deal with struggling students? Do we have the special education resources to deal with students' disability? On and on and on. That when we have all of those ingredients, I actually think that there's less need to worry about standards and measuring success, right? I mean, and, and some I, and there's there's a certain amount of irony in that the reason why we have tests or what tests really do what they really show us is the place where the state has refused to provide the resources for the neediest children to achieve what they need and then the other schools it just shows kids are doing exactly what they ought to be doing when they come from you know middle income families and they have you know the teachers that they need so it's it's almost like um what nclb did was suggest that by measuring a thing you could fix a thing. It's like, no, no, no. Well, you, you, you're just measuring the problem. You're not fixing the problem. And, and that's what we have in America is this, if we can just measure students at first with NCLB and tell the schools we're going to punish you if they don't achieve well, that that'll fix it. That didn't work. We said, well, then we'll measure the teachers based upon the student scores. And that way the teachers will fix the problem. It's like, no, all you're doing is diagnosing. The testing does not fix anything. It just diagnoses a thing at best. When are we going to get to the real work of fixing? That's not something that America's really been in the business of doing over the last couple of decades. Yeah, and I think a lot of people would have, and I've heard from former teachers and um, especially teachers that have taught at a high school, for example, for decades, right? And they had experience working in different, you know, under different administrations and whatnot. They've, and I'm going to play devil's advocate. These are the arguments I hear maybe against, uh, not against public education, but how public education can actually be shooting themselves in the foot in their own cause. So I've heard 
um, it's very hard to, and this is an argument I, I believe charter schools and, and the voucher uh, advocates would give, it's very hard to get rid of a bad teacher. Uh, how you judge a bad teacher um, is not necessarily test scores, right? But it's very hard to get rid of a good, uh, of, of a bad teacher. Uh, second, a lot of teachers now don't seem to be specializing in the subject that they're teaching. And I've heard, I, again, I'm not going to speak for the country as a whole. I'm from, I'm from New York City, and these are issues I've encountered and uh, I've seen in my day-to-day -day kind of life. A lot of teachers don't specialize in their subject. They teach, um, they, they, they get their master's in education, right? They don't have to take courses if they teach history. They don't have to take that many courses in history or whatnot. And I remember one time, uh, one of my uh, favorite historians, David McCullough, he, he had a, like a lecture and he said, um, we should abandon, for the most part, standardized tests, right? But he said, we need good teachers. And, and the, what defines a bad teacher is the fact that they're just a little bit above the students. And the students notice that. Like, students aren't dumb. They know that the person teaching them doesn't know much more than they do. So that, that's, that's an issue I've, I've also encountered. Then uh, it seems education standards, I've mentioned before, education standards have declined rapidly for, uh, in public schools, right? Like kids don't have to read a lot of the classics that say they, they should read and have sort of like a foundation of, uh, of knowledge. Civics is not taught in most schools. I was never taught civics, but people of past generations had civics courses. Um, and the, the biggest one I've heard from teachers is there are a lot of discipline issues. And now the onus is to prove that the, that the teacher did not in some way uh, make the student act out, right? And you mentioned before, right? Like when you were a kid, um, you would come back from school. And if you complained about a teacher, they, they, they'd ask the question my parents asked me. So what did you do wrong? They didn't assume the teacher did anything wrong. But now it seems to be the roles are a little bit reversed where the student has an immense level of power over the teacher. And I've, I've seen some, some really good teachers being caught up in, in scandals that they had nothing to do with, right? And my point is there, there, there is, those are the arguments I think the voucher and charter school advocates would give. And uh, how do you, how do we get back to a place where we can focus on these issues? And, yeah, I mean, I yeah. think you, 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 you've got two or three different things going on there, but let me, let me try to tackle a couple of them for you real quickly. One of those, and particularly since you're an economist, I think it'll speak to you. One of those is a market problem, right? It's, it's sort of like, you know, economists, good economists are good at sort of, hopefully, if, if they've got the right data, figuring out where, where the missing link is. And so what, what, what I find amazing is this sort of you know, data-driven approach and um, that wants to locate problems everywhere except for the market itself. What, what do I mean here? So yeah, there are some places um, where it's not that it's, I should say, it's not that it's, there are places where it can be harder to get rid of a teacher, but I don't think the primary problem that it's hard to get rid of a teacher. I think the primary problem is it's a market problem. There's no one to replace the teacher. There's no one to replace them. So that's the one thing I sort of thought was laughable, this attack on teacher tenure in, in California. They say the reason why you know, kids aren't getting an adequate education in California is because of grossly ineffective teachers. Well, number one, I look at the data, grossly ineffective teachers make up one to 3% at most of the, by their own data, one to 3%. Uh, of, of the teaching force. So you're telling me the reason why California schools are struggling is because one to three out of a hundred teachers are grossly inefficient. It's like remove them or not remove them. Like that's not why things are struggling. Now, the other thing is, well, if they really are that bad, you know, why doesn't the, you know, why doesn't the principal remove them? A lot of the principals will tell you it's not going to have anything to do with that they can't. It's like, I mean, what's the point? Yeah, I got to have a body in that room. There's no one lining up to teach in South Central LA and anyone that tells you otherwise is lying to you, right? Or at least there's no one lining up to stay. And I bet it's the same thing in New York City. 
right? It's like there aren't teachers banging on the pre-pandemic, bringing banging on you know the school district. Well, let me teach in school, you know, in, in public school number forty-five in New York. No, right? These 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 principals are you know the, the suburban schools don't have any problem getting teachers, right? Um, but so there, there, there are issues of race and financial inequality caught up in this problem of ineffective teachers. And it's like tenure isn't the problem, the market's the problem. So we are not attracting, we're not creating a profession, we're not offering salaries, we're not doing the things we need to do to have young folks like yourself say, you know what, I wanna make a career out of teaching. And actually once you get there, decide you wanna stay, right? There's this continual turnstile. Um, so that to me is, is, is the problem. And there's, of course, there's a lot of great teachers that have been around for a long time. that are kind of from, you know, a, a different generation, uh, some, sometimes. So, you know, that, that, that's part of it. And so then you go, you raise a specialization problem again, market problem. There's, there's no, you know, we need more STEM teachers, but if you've got, you know, STEM degree, you're going to go work in an engineering firm. You're going to go work in a lab. You're not going to go be a school teacher. You know, get paid $33,000 a year. To start. You're not going to do that. All right, and have to deal with all the nonsense. So again, you know, it, it's a market problem. It's not a it's not an education side problem. It's that sort of input problems that the state you know offers or doesn't offer. You know, discipline. You know, I wrote about this. I had a book called Ending Zero Tolerance. You know, there's this there's this you know you know perfect storm with discipline, which is you have teachers stressed out with demands to produce certain results on tests. Uh, graduation rates, et cetera. If they don't meet them, they're in trouble. The school's in trouble. And you got to rush, rush, rush to take kids that are here and get them, you know, to a much higher level to meet that standard. And it is a stressful environment in those schools. And, you know, some kid who's not quote unquote with it, that seems to be uh, causing a problem, like they're much quicker to jerk that kid, you know, suspend them, get them out of here. So again, I think that the overall regulatory structure creates a pressure cooker that puts teachers on edge, puts students on edge, you know, it, it, it's just not healthy. So the last point, you know, you, you said about standards and, and now I'm, I am gonna sound like an old man and, and maybe I'm getting there, but I mean, we, we've got a problem with standards, uh, you know, uh, across all of our, you know, education systems. You know, we still have the best higher education in the world but man, sometimes it feels like the standards are dropping fast in terms of, and this is, and, and I, and the reason why it's dropping is because, you know, higher education is always been a certain amount about consumerism. It's even more so now. The, the, the professionals don't make decisions. The consumers make the decisions and the economists tell you that would produce uh, better schooling. No, it doesn't. It just produces uh, bigger athletic facilities and, and bigger gyms and swimming pools and, and, and fancy dorms and Chick-fil-A, you know, on demand. That's what it produces. It doesn't produce better history professors or any of that stuff. So, and at the K through 12 level, you know, what does consumerism produce? It produces, well, I want to pick my school. I want to go to charter school. I want to go to a voucher, right? Th this isn't about producing better. <laughs> it, so maybe the root cause of the standards problem is in part a consumerism problem that in at least in the context of education the market does not or has not produced higher standards it has produced educators rushing to meet the non-educational demands of families and students rather than actually providing better education and um let me just ask a few more questions and i'm conscious of your time one more okay uh okay so the, the, the second one was going to be really quick, if you don't mind. Uh, one of them, so one is a general question. What gives you hope for the future? Um, I'll tie those two together. So again, it saves you some time. Uh, what gives you hope for the future? And the last question I wanted to ask were, what are five books that you would recommend for anyone to read on any subject um, that, you know, the Derek Black essential reading list? Um. Well, it may take me a little while on that five books, but I'm excited to get to that. One. Let me say about the hope for the future is that, you know, there's, there's, a, there's a silver lining that goes throughout this book. And it is that public education has faced enormous, enormous challenges throughout our history. Probably ones bigger than, than we have today, right? The rise of Jim Crow. 
and the attempt to reduce African Americans back to the status, uh, something close to slaves, is a far bigger threat to our world than anything that we see going on now. Public education survived that. There were people who said, you know what, we're wasting money and we're running this public education system, educate black kids, we don't wanna do that. And others said, no, no, we, we think we decided we like this thing, let's keep it. Public education survived racism. Um, racism survived too, but public education survived racism. In the civil rights movement in the 70s, when finally America was called to account for its racial sins of segregation in schools, there again was the push that said, well, if we can't have segregated public education, we won't have public education at all. We're going to voucherize it all. That's where the voucher movement starts. And it was primarily white mothers in the suburbs of Richmond that said, if our choice is between desegregated public education and no public education, we will reluctantly take desegregated public education. Public education survived. I could tell you other stories. The point, though, is there is something fundamentally American about public education. And I believe that notwithstanding all these problematic things I see going on, I believe there's a reservoir of commitment to the idea of public education that will get us to the other side. As I say in the book, that doesn't mean that public education is gonna be in a better place on the other side, but that it will survive so that we can build again and hopefully move once again towards a more perfect union. So, so I remain optimistic, um, but you know, as I, I tell folks, you know, be careful about my optimism. You know, I'm the guy that uh, will swear that a glass is half full when it's damn near bone dry. So, um, so be careful. You know, as of the five five books, uh, you know, you know, there, there there's so many uh, out there. But you know, I love Nancy McLean's uh, Democracy and Change. That that was a great great book. You know, this this past weekend, um, I I had my son read. Um, stamped you know the book on on anti-racism by by professor uh or by, kendi. by yeah kendi and, and reynolds and i am saying things i probably shouldn't say but i'm like you know if you want to read about <laughs> these things you read james baldwin right i mean you know james baldwin is is, is just you know the beauty of the pen is as some people say he's more like a poet than anything it's just you know great writing and 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 really thoughtful and weighty stuff. So anything by James Baldwin, you know, I love his novels too. You know, most it's it, people sort of focus on, uh, you know, the fire next time, but, but James Baldwin, you know, with Bill Street could talk and another country and other countries are great books. I love that. I love Cormac McCarthy. It's like the opposite of James Baldwin in so many ways. Um, but Cormac McCarthy, particularly his earlier work, you know, his, his later work, which got made into movies sort of got the most attention, but I think Cormac McCarthy's, earliest work um, helps us reflect on ourselves as, as humans um, and and there's something very touching about his work. It's very dense, hard to get through, but if you're looking for real dense, the denseness, you know, you, you go to Dostoyevsky, uh, so, but I, you know, I love Dostoyevsky, the Karamazov brothers, you know, so now I, I feel like I'm running off people from reading as I, as I relate these, but fantastic stuff. Um, you know, I've, I'm working on a new book and been reading a lot uh, of stuff about uh, Denmark Vesey in particular. Not, a lot of people don't know about Denmark Vesey, but he, he was on the verge of, of a multi-thousand person revolt here in Charleston before they found him out, you know, in, eight, in, in 1818. But, um, you know, there's some really powerful figures, African-Americans during the sort of pre-Civil uh, War era, you know, here in the South, it's fascinating. So, you know, all of that's good stuff. I've just, more and more, I'm just reading history and, and loving it. You know, you mentioned, uh, you know, David McCullough, you know, his great work. So, you know, I would say, instead of rambling, you know, find a person in history to read about. Um, and, and there's just so much great nonfiction biographies out right, right now that you, 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 could, you could read anything. And I, I think it would be great nowadays. Great. Uh, Derek Black, thank you for joining me. Schoolhouse Burning. Appreciate it. Thank you. Awesome. Have a good one.